Okay, Rick, you do this to me all the time. You bring me to a clump of rocks in the middle of nowhere. We should be standing over by the Irish Brigade mo Monument because everybody looks at the Irish Brigade Monument and you're from Notre Dame. They may take your card. Why are no, we standing here? I've, I've given them enough money. So. Okay. Um, for people who don't recognize this location, Fran's exactly right. We're standing on the Stony Hill right next to the wheat field where we started talking about our soldiers. Directly to our right is the very well-known Irish Brigade Monument. And I would tell you, because everybody looks at that monument, the monument immediately to our right is to the 5th Michigan, right up here. We always feel like a shout out to the 5th Michigan is appropriate. But that's not why we're here, friend. We're here because of this plaque on this rock. And we're going to start talking about how these wounded men are um, taken off the battlefield, how their care is started by standing here at what's called a field aid station or a dressing station or a forward aid station. And there are literally dozens of these all around this battlefield. We'll talk about the organization of the medical corps to some degree, but every Union Corps, every Confederate Corps has multiple field aid stations. We are standing in the only one that I know of that's marked on the battlefield. Marked on the battlefield. So our soldiers are wounded, and now not to this field aid right. station, but they to a be, field aid. To a, okay, so and why here? What? When? How do? Why am I in rocks with my field aid station? I think the best way to think about a field aid station is to consider it, if you will, um, a modern day ambulance without a truck and without wheels. This is where first aid is brought to the injured soldiers. It's, you got to be within proximity to where they're wounded, so you're within range of the enemy but you've got to be protected. And these field aid stations are usually put behind rocks. We're on the back side of the Stony Hill. Other field aid stations are behind just big rocks. Other field aid stations are in ravines. Many field aid stations are in farmhouses within range of the enemy. But this is where the injured soldier is gotten to for the first part of his care. Right. And the only Confederate I'm aware of is the Timbers Farm. Well, yeah. Which is which you sold the car that we can't find. No, we know uh, yeah. where to find the Timbers. The, but they had the same system. The Confederate system uh, was largely mirroring the 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 Union system. Right. So, right. Um, so what? So why here? What's what makes this the field aid station? What do you need? Well, you need some protection. And again, we're in this low area here. Um, you're protected by large rocks. We're on, as I said, the back side of the hill. If there's a source of water, but that's not as important as for when we get to the next level, but you just got to be able to devote your attention to the wounded soldiers. The, uh, the surgeons who are up here, and we'll talk a little bit about those individuals, make it very clear that they need their help to focus on the injuries to the soldiers and not where the bullets are coming from. It makes sense. Right. Now, this is something relatively new, two years into the Civil War. Right. The, um, at the start of the Civil War, the medical system was very fragmented. Almost every regiment would have their own surgeon. And it took the, the plan by this man. We talked about Dr. Letterman at the opening. Uh, Jonathan Letterman is put into position around July 1st, 1862, so at the end of the Peninsular Campaign. He puts together a system in order to evacuate or move wounded soldiers in a timely fashion. He realizes that's what it's going to take for these wounded men to have a chance to survive. And Jonathan Letterman puts into position a three-tiered evacuation system, of which we're standing at the first tier in that. And I would suggest that it's at its best here at the Battle of Gettysburg. It made a big difference at the Battle of Antietam. Uh, but it really comes to its maximal efficiency, therefore saving lives here at the, at the Battle of Gettysburg. So what happens to our wounded men when they get here? Who's here and what are they doing? There is a medical crew here. There are individuals who are sent out from the medical corps, usually one surgeon, an assistant surgeon, and he will have hospital stewards with him, which think nurse slash pharmacist slash orderly. They're to help get these men into a safe position. 
this surgeon's job is to render first aid. Now, the surgeon who's here, again, isn't taking care of our four wounded soldiers, but Dr. Zebdile Boylston Adams is the assistant surgeon for the 32nd Massachusetts Infantry, whose monument is up the loop here on the Stony Hill. He is a young surgeon, uh, often not as experienced as some of the other surgeons we're going to talk about at other levels. Um, so he's not, he's not the best surgeon, but he's making some terrible decisions. He, he would be a young surgeon sent out here to do just that, Fran. Um, this first level of care, the field aid station, involves, as Fran just said, some pretty weighty decisions by these guys. As the wounded are brought in um, by either their own power or their comrades, and their comrades are turned around and sent back out because, we'll talk about this, there are ambulances to get these guys out of this place. But three decisions have to be made by this man. You're going into one of three groups. If you have a minor wound, you know, something to a finger, a foot, it can be bandaged up and you may even be able to return to the front lines. If you are shot in the head or the abdomen, and likely the chest, those are largely in 1863, head and abdomen anyway, are unsurvivable wounds. You, there's no capacity to open the abdominal cavity or do brain surgery. Um, uh, and so you will be put into the uh, mortal wounding uh, uh, triage category. And you're not going to be quickly moved off this battlefield because your wound is not compatible with life. The really important decision to make is what's called the surgical group. And they have injuries that they can potentially survive if timely medical care is given to them. Largely extremity injuries because uh, surgery can safely be done on the extremities. Right. Now you trained at Baltimore Shock Trauma. Right. Right. And you had Dr. Crowley. Is that yeah. One yeah. golden hour. Yeah. So, so in a strange way, Letterman is kind of laying the groundwork. Yeah. Move fast. Yeah. And, and he's very clear on that. Rapid evacuation, appropriate evacuation is very important. And to do that, um, one of the very interesting battles that Jonathan Letterman has to fight is who's in charge of the ambulances. It would seem to stand to reason that the medical corps should be in charge of the ambulances. But in fact, when he comes on board in his position as the medical director of the Army of the Potomac, the ambulances are controlled by the quartermaster department. And so sometimes medical supplies are in the ambulances, sometimes tents are in the ambulances. Sometimes the ambulance is going to where the wounded are, sometimes they're dropping off supplies. Jonathan Letterman gets an efficient ambulance corps with trained individuals, not musicians, but trained individuals to get these wounded so he, men he off gets, of them. He gets people in the military, not hiring like you and me, no, like at the beginning. No, not civilians, right. Yeah. These are soldiers who volunteer or are, are pressed into doing ambulance duty. And where we're standing, I would not be here with the bullets. Sorry. <laughs> very um, do you want to say anything about the ambulances? Friend? Well, we, we, we know you guys have discussed the ambulances. They're, they're mostly the four-wheel ambulance now. The two-wheel ambulance is called an avalanche because it bounces around. But I also want to give a shout out to, we have paramedics on this battlefield. You just have to look for them. One of them is with the 3rd Michigan. Her name is Annie Etheridge. Annie Etheridge is a, help me Rick, Vivendier. V Vivendier. Thank you. I don't speak much French. I barely speak, speak English. <laughs> but her job is like the house mother. She's a young woman here in her, her mid-twenties, but when the bullets start flying, she is the first, I think, the first paramedic. She's got a horse with uh, lint, which is to stop bleeding, and she's evacuating soldiers off the field. Their first thing would be, if it's not of a Vindier, it's one of their buddies right. helping them get off of the battlefield, right. which is one of the things that reduces the firepower, right? If, the, if your buddies are helping you off the field, guess who's not firing back at you? Right. So, so the soldiers are being evacuated. How do they find these places just by natural, or how do they find these? Well, there's actually often markings on the field, red flags right on tree branches that will direct the wounded back to this uh, sort of location. Right. And we've talked about the terrain features that make for a good forward aid station. I want to emphasize little to no surgery is being done here. But I got my foot on mash rock. Yeah, yeah we've, we've heard this rock 
termed as amputation rock as if this served as a site for amputations to be done. We doubt that. I guess as a former, I guess always, an orthopedic surgeon, I would tell you the only surgeries that were done here were injuries that were hanging by a thread and could just be completed with a, like a Bayard simple Wilkerson. knife. Yeah, like Bayard Wilkerson, uh, Wilkerson out on the first right. day. Um, maybe like Dan Sickles for True. all we know. Yeah. Um, but the surgeries were not being done here. They were being done at the next level of care that we'll talk about. Because they don't have you anesthesia. Anesthesia, right. right. I think, well, the people watching these videos know this. One of the important things that we make sure our visitors know on this battlefield as medical professionals, 95% of all the surgery in the Civil War was done under a general anesthetic. We're not having people bite bullets or sticks. Uh, anesthesia has been around for 20 years. Now, that doesn't mean that surgery is commonplace because there are no antibiotics. There's no understanding of bacteria. There's no IVs. understanding of a clean operating room. There's yeah. no IVs. But you can be put to sleep so that your suffering is controlled during an operation. But that's not being done here. Right. So this that's being done at the next yeah, level. We right. think it, this is a very limited mash. Right. Um, tell, me, tell me the requirements then. Um, the requirements of, 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 of a field aid station. Isn't that what you're going to tell us? Right. But, uh, this is just a, a, a description of what people uh, need to know about field aid stations and what is done here. Talking to somebody who would be reading this, he should bear in mind that anything he does for them is but temporary. This is addressed to the assistant surgeon, like Dr. Z. Boylston Adams. He has not instruments, assistance, time, or any of the facilities to undertake operations not immediately required, such as I said, completing a near amputation. Nor if he had, would it be well for him to attempt them when a corps of surgeons is waiting a little to the rear with all the appliances necessary to attend to his patients. The dressings he applies in all severe cases will be taken off soon again. The fractured limbs will be re-examined to determine the question of amputation or resection. Balls remaining in the wounds will be sought for, and the wounded general be, generally will be looked over anew as they arrive. That's exactly what happens at a trauma center where you and I work. They're brought in from the field, the splints are taken off, the, the dressings are taken mm -hmm. off. You have to reassess things reassess anew it. when you go from here to the next level. Now, in the, in the South Lafayette Guild is Jonathan Letterman. Do I have that correct? Yes. Right. Yeah, so medical director. He's for the, the medical Army director for Lee. So Lafayette Guild, they're they're mirroring this. It just it just works. The yeah. system the system just just works. Not from the beginning. So for our soldiers, when I said at the beginning, they're fortunate that Jonathan Letterman and Lafayette Guild, if you're wearing gray. Are, are taking command of their responsibility. Well, they've created a system that enables individuals to survive. Do you have anything to tell us about Z. Boylston Adams? As well, an how about I do the guys? Okay. And then we oh, got, that's we, right. We yeah. can't leave without talking about Mr. A Dr. Adams. Right. He's, he's got a he's got great a story. Interesting. So let's history. go back to our people. So this is um, Robert Forrester. Now, yeah. I will tell you, when Rick and I provide medical uh, information. We work on an M&M &M level, which is a hospital thing in all states, and we look for primary source documents. Give them a, two sentences on what an M&M &M is. It's not a small hard candy. It's a, a conference that stands for morbidity and mortality. And I would just say to Fran and anybody sitting in an M&M &M room, this is the most important conference in a hospital. This is when we openly discuss what went right and more importantly, maybe what didn't go right, what actually went wrong, because just like everything in life, in the healthcare profession, you learn more when things don't go well. Correct. Uh, and we often present these cases uh, as cases in an M&M, &M, morbidity and mortality right. conference. So there's a lot, as everybody knows in history, there's a lot of I heard, they heard, they heard. Before you know it, something that's not true becomes fact, like maybe amputation rock. rock right. Amputation rock. So we're going to give you information from the best sources that we can get. So let's talk about this guy. First of all, it took me forever to figure out why I couldn't find him. His name is Robert McKay Forrester, Captain, and he has a brother, Robert H. Forrester in Company A. So first of all, there's two Forresters. <laughs> okay. This one, he's not going to make it here. He is uh, going to be one of our soldiers wounded up in the in the wheat field, right. a head injury, and the most we have is from Captain R. M. Wadding. He said, Captain Forrester of Company C was shot in the head and laid not three yards from me. While lying there at night, it being moonlight, I saw a rebel approach him and take the pocketbook out of his side pocket, put the same in his own pocket, same and also as he was visiting other dead bodies. 
having a companion with them, they engaged in the same business. So we know that Robert M. Forrester is wounded up there, but his story is going to come on a little bit later. Right. Let's talk about this guy, Rick. This is that. This is right down your age. 18-year-old James M. Bill, um, amputation in the right upper third of his arm. Yeah. What's going to happen? What's going to happen when he gets here? And well, be, when he gets to a, a, a field aid station. Uh, if he's hemorrhaging, if there's an arterial injury, a tourniquet is going to be applied and to try to stop the uh, bleeding. The wound is going to be dressed. It may or may not be splinted if they have splinting equipment. And he'll be loaded, he'll be put into the surgical subgroup, loaded into an ambulance and taken to the next level of care. Okay, then we got this guy. This is Jack um, Bayard. Uh, Bayard, boy, another orthopedic one. Well, that happened. Shot in the hip. <laughs> Yeah. Now this one's different because the hip's a pelvis. Yeah. And that was his, that was his specialty, and he was a pelvic reconstruction surgery. So why don't we talk a little bit about yeah. Mr. Bayard here? Getting shot in the hip is a pretty um, vague sort of injury, and it can include everything from uh, a major blood vessel injury you will die from almost instantaneously, to bony injuries, to nerve injuries, and um, uh, it can have a whole different set of injury parameters that we talk about. So getting shot in the hip might include breaking bones. It might include cutting blood vessels. It might include injuries to your bladder. Um, so it's a very vague injury and, and um, sometimes very serious injury. Right, and from, from our viewpoint, <coughs> where that wound is, that hip, I'm telling you, it has more places to bleed from than I think oh, we sure. know. And because yeah. of the location, um, blood can pull. A lot of it can right. pull. So I'm kind of thinking <coughs> when they find him, you're shot in the hip, there's not a lot of surgery to do for him, but they're going to stabilize him and move him out and right. move him to the next level. We'll talk right. about. This is the one we like to talk about. This is John Green. I don't have a picture of him. Um, <laughs> sorry. Wound location, shot in the liver. That's yeah. like getting shot in your oil filter. Yeah. So why do, we, why do we kind of smile about shot in the liver? Because we've seen shot in the liver. Yeah. We've, we both have worked at hospitals where liver injuries occur. You don't survive a, mass, a massive liver injury. If he's shot in the liver, he should be dead probably within a half an hour. And so as we follow this man's journey, we will amend his wound description to shot around the liver because right. he couldn't have been shot in the liver and survived. And, and for those of you that have never seen a human liver, the problem is Rick can reach in with a suture and a clamp and he can clamp an artery and suture it, shut or burn it. The liver is like yeah. suturing into an egg. A yeah. hard boiled egg is what they describe and I've seen it. Um, the, the way they make them stop in modern surgery, they have a, 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 an electric cautery yeah, that fires like a, a layer of gas yeah. to get down. Yeah. So we, we, we like him a lot. Shot around the liver. But we're going to amend it to yeah. shot around the liver. Yeah. Now we would, be, we would be amiss before we leave here. Uh, we'll, let's talk about uh, Boylston Adams one more time and then where these people are going next. Yeah, I'll take to the next level of care. You. Dr. Z. Boylston Adams is from Boston, a very, um, a very prominent family. I would say the Adams family, but it is the John Adams family, not the yeah. creepy house family. Your cousin yeah, tell us from a little, Boston. <laughs> Tell us a little more about Zebdial Boylston Adams, friend. So Zebdial Boylston Adams, um, he does a, a, a job here, a Herculean job making these decisions, but afterwards, I don't know, Rick, he has like a post-traumatic stress. Yeah. He has a, a reaction to this where he, he's blind, right? Yeah. He can't see and he's paralyzed. And that's, that's unusual, but not totally unusual. I think it's one of the things that we, and again, your group of, 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 uh, of listeners and audience know this, it's evidence of how hard the medical corps worked. These guys kept working and working for days after uh, the, the fighting stops. Um, the fighting stops in the afternoon of July 3rd. These guys have to keep working, uh, sometimes with very little rest, to the point that they physically break down, and that's mm -hmm. what happened to Dr. Adams. And I've always wondered why he starts school at Harvard and ends up graduating from Bowdoin College. Yeah, did, did he knew that Joshua Chamberlain yeah. would be the man? No, be I, I doubt that. <laughs> I think that uh, it's, it's very interesting, that part of his history. And as it's been explained to me by people who know this man's history, he started at Harvard, 
but then was dismissed from Harvard and enrolled in and graduated from Bowdoin. And my understanding is that the dismissal was about his relationship with Harvard's president's daughter. Oh, no. And that president was one Edward Everett, who is known here for giving the yeah. two-hour speech with no notes prior to the two-and-a-half minutes. He probably speech couldn't even did. read why it was dismissed. Well, he may not have been able yeah. to. Um, um, well, Wilson Adams, you'll run into him again. You just told me last night. Yeah, he he rejoins the army, but not in the medical staff. He joins as a, a commander of troops. And in the Battle of the Wilderness, uh, not quite a year later, he's actually been shot through the leg and is lying next to another famous general here at Gettysburg, James Wadsworth, who's been shot in the head and, and, and literally uh, watches him die over the course of about uh, 36 hours after the injury. So um, I think that's an interesting association yeah. with this man. And a tie-in for today, he's going to live, I'm going to, I have to tell him about how he dies, but he's going to live and become the medical examiner in Boston. Um, he's an advocate of vaccination, believe right. it or not. Right. He believes in vac. now not like we're doing today, they would literally take a scraping of smallpox and put it on your kid, right, or they right. would put you in a room with somebody that had chicken pox and let your kid get it. He was a very big com uh, advocate of that. Right. But he's a medical examiner, and he, he's gonna die a traumatic disease. In 1902, in Framing, Framingham, Massachusetts, he's inspecting a dam right. for cleanliness and-, and Some uh, kind of his public health public sort of health stuff. Public health type right. thing, and he falls off the dam. And drowns. And drowns, yeah. Yeah. and so. So anyhow, he's an interesting guy. Yep. All right, so Boylson Adams now has made his decision, and he's going to start sending some of our men out. Where are they going? And that's our next stop. And the next portion of this Letterman plan is to move people from a field aid station to a division field hospital. And is it in rocks? Uh, no, it's in farms, Okay. barns, <laughs> often populated by livestock shortly before okay. this. The, when the armies get to the battlefield, the medical director of each corps finds a location, and we can talk about that, that's suitable for a hospital, and they establish a division field hospital at that site. And there's a very significant organization that works there that we can talk about when we start to talk about division field hospitals. This map <coughs> roughs out where many of the division field hospitals in Gettysburg are. These need to be out of range of the enemy. And as we talk about uh, at this battle, that becomes problematic for uh, one of the Union uh, uh, Corps that is here. But you can see they're, they're spread pretty far from, from town. But this is where the surgeries are done. Not here, but at the division field. Hobbling. And the ambulances will start taking them out and yep. the men will start hobbling yep. back. Yep. All right, so the only thing we'll tell the visitors looking, if you want to find this, you have to look for the 5th Michigan right. Monument. Yeah. But you'll never Which is see right it across from the Irish Brigade Monument. You're always looking monument. at the Irish Brigade Monument. Right. Thank you. Thanks so much for watching. Really appreciate it. Thanks again to Rick and Fran for helping us out with these videos. Uh, subscribe to our channel to stay up to date to the latest videos. Become a member of the National Museum of Civil War Medicine if you want to support programming like this. And we'll catch you in the next video.